Me and Alexis, we weren't in the Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Enoch Pratt Free Library. My name is Vivian Fisher, and I am Deputy Chief of the Pratt Library State Library Resource Center here at the Central Library. We are joined this evening with two phenomenal writers, Connie Briscoe, in conversation with Marita Golden. But before I introduce these women, I want to remind you that we have several upcoming programs that can be found in our Compass newsletter. So please pick one up if you don't get one mailed to you. And also, um, at the end of this conversation, we will have 15 minutes of Q&A. Microphones are located at each end of the auditorium. So without further ado, this evening, our moderator, Marita Golden, is an American novelist, nonfiction writer, professor, and co-founder of the Hurston Wright Foundation, a national organization that serves as a resource center for African-American writers. She also served as president emerita of the foundation. She is a veteran teacher, writer, and acclaimed award-winning author of 17 works of fiction, nonfiction, and anthologies. She has served as a teacher at numerous colleges and universities throughout the country. Connie Briscoe is an American writer of romantic and historical fiction. Briscoe's first novel, Sisters and Lovers, back in 1994, sold nearly 500,000 copies in cloth and paperback combined in its first two years. In 2000, Briscoe was honored by Galdet, Galdet University with the Amos Kendall Award presented to a deaf person in recognition of his or her notable excellence in a professional field not related to deafness. Her third book, A Long Way From Home, was nominated for the NAACP Image Awards. Briscoe ranks among an emerging group of black female authors who are writing novels and contemporary middle-class black characters. Her first novel, Sisters and Lovers, sold well and it garnered her a six-figure paperback deal and was made into a miniseries for CBS. That success allowed her to transition to a full-time novelist, having previously worked as a magazine editor for Galdat University, among other jobs that she's had. Briscoe has written 12 novels to date. We are pleased to hear about Briscoe's latest novel, You Never Know, and now, without further delay, please join me and our guest writers to Baltimore and the Pratt Library. Hello. Hello, 
everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Hi, everyone. It's great to see all of you. Thank you for coming tonight. Well, Connie, you made us wait too long. <laughs> yeah, I know. We were just talking about it. It's amazing how much time slips by. But it's been, as I was telling Marita, probably about 10 years since my last book came out. And um, th sometimes it's, it's hard to believe how long it is. But as I was telling Marita, I, I needed a break. Um, I needed a change. I, I had young children, and uh, that can be very taxing. Um, so I decided to sh change gears. But now I'm back, and uh, that feels good, too. I'm glad to be back. Sometimes when you take a break, um, there's specific things that come out of that break that you take into the creative process. Did you find, you know, like not writing, not thinking about writing, impacted the writing of this book in any way? Probably so in, in some way. Um, I had always, I used to write, I guess you would call them sister girl novels or <laughs> <laughs> relationship novels. And this is my first mystery. I'm not sure without that break to reassess things, to get away from the romance novels, that I would ever have tried a mystery novel. Even though um, all my life growing up, I probably read, I read the romance novels, but I also read a lot of mystery novels. Ag Ag Agatha Christie wrote, I think, 80 novels. I probably read 60 of them. My father, <laughs> my father and I used to exchange them. Um, so uh, without that break, I, I'm not, I probably would have continued writing the relationship novels. So that gave me an excuse, an easy way to write something new, to come up with something fresh. Yeah, because a lot of times the, the creative process is just so mysterious that we don't know how it's going to work. Yes. And there are things inside of us that we're not aware of things we want to do that we can't do until we stop doing the thing that we've always been doing. Yeah, and, and in this case, it was inside, but I was blocking it, I guess, because um, I do remember when I first decided to write my first novel, Sisters, Sisters and Lovers, I thought about writing a mystery for a hot minute, but I thought it would be too complicated to tackle as a first novel. And um, at that time, there were not um, the romance novels, the sister girl, um, the chick lit novels were just starting to come onto the scene. And I'd certainly read a, read a lot of them. So I thought it would be, and I was living that life basically as a single woman. Sister, so in some you ways, were, okay, you were a sister girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in some ways, it was, seemed like it would be a lot easier to write that. And so I put the mystery aside and. Um, yeah, and went on to write some very su successful um, women's literature uh, at a time when that was the hot thing. And um, uh, ha I, did some, I did some wonderful things in that field. And now it seems though almost as if the new hot thing is suspense and mysteries and thrillers. I don't know if we watch so much of it on television, so much of the real life suspense so much of it in fiction, but now that seems the new hot topic. How was writing a suspense novel different than what you'd written before? Um, it was different in a number of ways. Um, in some ways, in many ways, writing is writing. I've always been big on plotting before I start to write. And what I discovered with a mystery is that plotting is much more important. I think it's always important, but it's especially important with a mystery because everything has to work out. Or you have to plot the red herrings, you have to plot the clues, you have to plot the misleading clues in addition to plotting the novel. And that was new to me. It also forces you to organize yourself better, to structure your novel better. Uh, that was one of the things that was new to me. Another thing that was new with this novel, not necessarily because of the suspense angle, was the fact that this was the first time that I 
uh, included a deaf woman, a hearing impaired woman. And throughout the course of the novel, she starts out wearing hearing aids, which I did because I'm also hearing impaired. And then eventually she got a cochlear implant, which I did too, as my um, deafness became more pronounced. And so by the time I wrote the novel, I realized that it had been, oh, 20 years that I got my implant in 2003. I was writing the mystery in about 2020. It had been almost 20 years since I'd had it. And I realized that when you get an implant, let's, let me say this first, when you get an implant, your hearing improves gradually over time. It starts out better than it is before you got the implant, but it keeps improving. And it, it, it's an, it's an amazing, amazing gadget in that it keeps improving for years after you get it. So by the time I wrote the novel 20 years later, I had to go back and dig into my notes and you know, uh, go back into my mind and try to remember what it was like oh. or what I could hear back then before I got the implant. So that was different in the kind of research I had to do because I had this hearing impaired character for the first time. So it sounds like, well, a couple of things. A lot of times I know in my own writing, um, I have to grow into the ability to tell a story. I'm not smart enough, I'm not brave enough, I'm not wise enough. And it sounds like this is a story that whether you knew it or not, you had to grow into the ability to tell it. You mean into the ability to? Not the, the, the sort of the consciousness maybe, the, and, and the willingness and the ability to tell it. Because, you mean to tackle a yeah, hearing impaired tackle, character? to tackle both the mystery and the hearing impaired. And you, yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I had been asked before, Connie, why don't you include a deaf, a deaf character? And, and that's the thing about deafness. Is it's so different for so many people. There's no one way to be deaf. There are people who are born deaf. There are people who become deaf uh, in older age. There are people who have accidents and become deaf. There are people who just are hearing it and one day wake up and they're losing their hearing. So, um, but for me, it, it, the aspect was being late deaf. And, and I, I thought it would be too complicated to try to, it, to it's a very if, iffy issue in the deaf community. And I thought it would be too complicated to try to tell, talk about these issues um, when I personally was not a part of the deaf culture. There's a whole deaf group who was born deaf. Uh, they only use American Sign Language. They mainly associate with other deaf people and those are considered culturally deaf. I don't consider myself culturally deaf because I grew up in the hearing impaired community, in the hearing community. Mm -hmm. So there, was, there were all these complications. I actually left a previous job working in politics. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Joint Center for Political Studies. Mm -hmm. yeah. You are. I left there after 10 years working there because the politics were driving me crazy. This was during the Reagan era. So I needed to get out of there. Politics were driving all of us crazy. During that era. I thought I would take a nice little job at Gallaudet University and work with the deaf and then just, you know, coast on easy street. No way. If, there, if anything, there are more political and social and all kinds of issues within the deaf community that I had never dreamed would exist is who talks and who signs and it, 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 it's, it's very, very complicated. Um, but I enjoyed my time there. I learned a lot for sure. And I, I'm not sure I ever would have been able to write this character, Alexis, in You Never Know, if I had not immersed myself at some point in the deaf community and learned more about all the different aspects and ways that, that a person can be hearing impaired and what's available to them to improve the situation. And some people don't, those who are culturally deaf don't want to improve their situations. A lot of them don't want hearing aids. They don't want cochlear implants. It's a very, very complicated issue, which is why I put off writing about it for so long. And 
uh, and just took time, I guess, being away from it and thinking about it to be brave enough to, to dive into it as well as to be brave enough. And by the time I went into mis writing my first mystery novel, I had written at least nine novels. Well, maybe seven novels and two nonfiction books. So I had a lot more confidence as a writer. Mm -hmm. And I think that because of that, by that time, I was also ready to tackle a mystery novel. How did you lose your hearing? That complicated too. I was born into a family where my father had a mild hearing loss. And I was born myself with a mild hearing loss that got progressively worse okay. as I got older. By the time I was a young adult in my early 20s, I had gone from having sort of like a 20% hearing loss mm -hmm. to having 20% hearing. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it changed, both, it changed so quickly. And most of the people in my family, because it was on my father's side, some of my cousins and my sister also had hearing losses, but none of them took that nosedive in terms of being able to hear and not able to hear. There may have been one or two cousins who had similar problems, but I think mine is probably the worst. And um, when I reached a point where the hearing was getting, well, well, let me back up. I was able to navigate everyday life for a long time because when I was a child and they realized I had a hearing loss, they put me into what's called um, the, a class where they teach you lip reading, speech reading or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so for the longest time, even though I, I wasn't, even though I was losing my hearing, I was able to get by one-on-one -on -one especially with other people, because I could read lips. I had some hearing, and I could combine that with the lip reading and get by. Um, but it was getting worse and worse, and it was reaching a point where it was impacting my ability to do the things and to make the progress in life that I wanted to make. I had aspirations of becoming an editor at the Washington Post. And I realized that to do a lot of these jobs, you need to be able to use the telephone. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't. I could sit there one-on-one -on -one and interview someone and come up with an article, but I couldn't call someone on the telephone. And um, so that it was impacting a lot of my life. And it, when I realized that it was going to have an impact and that it was not going to get better, that was when I decided probably not until, what was I, in my 40s? that I decided to get the cochlear implant. I waited too long. And also the, the, the technology was not always there. When okay. I got it, it had been around maybe right. 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. and it had improved so it was, and it was safe, so. The, the novel is, is very rich in that as a person who is not experienced hearing impairment, there's a lot of very rich educational information about the lives of the hearing impaired. And there's that as well as the suspense story. Um, without revealing too much, I was surprised that in the novel, the heroine um, has fears. She works with special needs children, but she has a real concern about bringing a deaf child into the world. Could you talk about that? I think as a deaf woman, certainly for me and probably for others, at, at times it feels almost like I have a triple whammy when it comes to being accepted into mainstream society. I'm black first, I'm deaf and I'm a woman. And all of these can lead to discrimination and disadvantages in society. And so Alexis, although she wants children, she's reluctant because she thinks that she would feel responsible for bringing, and this, remember when I was writing this, we were going through Black Lives Matter. We were going through the Me, Me Too movement. We were going through all of those things. So she's wondering, do I want to bring a person who would definitely be, be Black who will possibly be hearing impaired and who will definitely be female? Do I want them 
to bring someone into, into the world like that who will have to tackle all of these issues. I am a black woman, um, I think, well, let me put it this way. I think if it were just one or two, if she were just a black woman and would not have to deal with the deafness, that would be different. But to throw the deafness on top of it, to make, make, make navigating as a black woman, which is hard enough, even more challenging. And so she, she thinks about this. I, it's not something that's unheard of among um, not just black deaf women, but deaf women, period, do I want to bring a child into that, um, who, into this world, who that may not be as receptive and accepting of um, someone with all these um, challenges. Now, this is a suspense novel, a novel that tackles, you know, the issues around, quote, disability, but differently able people. Mm -hmm. But did you have fun writing it? <laughs> oh, I had a ball writing it. <laughs> yeah, you know, Alexis is disabled, but I've lived with disability all my life. It's not crippling. It's, it, 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 it's challenging. But in some ways, I think it actually makes you a better person. You have to be more aware. And I tried to show this somewhat with Alexis. You have to be more aware. You have to learn how to navigate the world with these disadvantages. You, especially if you are determined to achieve, if you are determined to be successful. Um, so yeah, I had fun showing how she does that. I, and one of the reasons I wanted to work with a woman who is deaf is that I read one of the mystery writers who I used to read a lot was Sidney Sheldon. And he once said that the best protagonist in suspense or thriller is a woman who is vulnerable. And what is more, and, and you think about it, just about all of his characters are vulnerable, vulnerable women. Um, and what would be more vulnerable than a deaf woman who's attacked when the lights are out? <laughs> so, um, and how she navigates that and how she tries to figure out who tried to attack her. Um, so th the, the, uh, the vulnerabil vulnerability was built into the character, so to speak, which is one reason why uh, I made her deaf. But it was, it was fun trying to figure out how she would deal with some of the, the obstacles in terms of her husband, in terms of an boyfriend who comes back on the scene. It was fun to figure out I mean, this is something I, I, I normally do with my relationship novel. How do women navigate men who are not treating them well? But in addition to that, I had to deal with a woman who couldn't hear all the time or couldn't hear as well as other women. And so that was, I like to be challenged when I write. That's certainly challenging. Um, the, myth, the writing mystery in itself challenged me, uh, working with a woman who was deaf, uh, which I had not done in fiction before also challenged me. So yes, that, the challenge is fun for me. When I was reading it, what struck me was that, yes, she does have this unique set of challenges, but she's, she's, she's very normal. I mean, she's a, she's a black woman looking for love. You know, she's, she's got this job and she's trying to, you know, do that job well. And She's got these friends and these relationships and she has the same neuroses and insecurities that anyone would have. So that was very satisfying. Yeah. Well, well, one of the things I was trying to show with her as a black professional deaf woman or hearing impaired woman was that there are black hearing impaired women who are very successful, mm -hmm. who can have a job. We have this assumption that Deaf people, unfortunately, uh, deaf people are often, it's often believed or they're portrayed as being um, helpless. Unemployable. Unemployable. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's so not true because I said the spectrum of deaf people is so wide. We're not monolithic. There are deaf people who can do just about anything someone else would do if, they, if they're just allowed to hear. They're smart, 
they're capable, they're ambitious. Um, so that is one of the things I was trying to show with Alexis that you do have deaf people out there who are intelligent, uh, successful, um, want to get ahead, and um, really just like the rest of us. And I'm, I'm, I, I hope I was able to show that with her. You did. Uh, why don't you read, read a little bit now for us? Okay. Um, I tend to have seasonal allergies, but actually I have them all year round. They're supposed to be seasonal in the spring. And so my voice often gets hoarse when I read long passages. So I'll read briefly from the beginning. Let me get some water first. I'll read a, a few paragraphs from the prologue. So tell me, Mrs. Roberts, Office, Officer Sands said, exactly what happened to you here tonight? The officers spoke slowly and clearly, having learned that the victim was nearly deaf and wore a cochlear implant. EMT workers had just treated her badly battered and bloody feet and legs and wrapped her shivering wet body in a dark, heavy towel. She cradled a bruised elbow in an ice pack on her lap. Her damp, curly hair clung to her cheeks as she rocked back and forth on the living room couch. The EMT workers packed up their medical gear and let themselves out the front door of the townhouse. The white stucco contemporary end unit sat on a hillside overlooking one of several man-made lakes in the planned community of Columbia, Maryland. Wild Lake was not the deepest of the lakes, <laughs> ranging from eight to 13 feet but its deceptively beautiful shimmering waters were dangerous enough to end a life and had nearly ended hers. This was when the police officers come to her house right after she's been attacked. She's escaped unharmed, but she does not know who attacked her. And we spend, the, I guess, the remainder of the novel trying to determine who it was who attacked Alexis, was it her husband? This was a man who seemed like the man of her dreams. He changes during the course of her marriage. And so she becomes suspicious of him, especially when she learns what happened with his ex-wife. Or was it her ex-boyfriend who became insanely jealous when she left him to go, with, uh, to go, to go and uh, marry this man who ju she just met? She, she also has a su suspicious neighbor. So we go throughout the pages of the novel trying to figure out who attacked her in this scene. This is a prologue, and then we come up to the present where she's attending a fair, an affair where she meets the man of her dreams. Who turns out to be the man of her nightmares. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he really does. <laughs> what do you want readers to take away from the book? You know, a great read, but anything else? A great read. I want you to be entertained. Um, I want you to enjoy yourself. For me, that's what fiction is about, especially mysteries that involve murder and attacks and whatnot. I don't, I don't want you to leave fearful that something like this will happen, but and while you're in, in your bedroom, in your house where you feel safe, I want you to feel entertained. Now that you've written a suspense novel, do you see yourself writing any more or going back to Yes, that? I actually have a contract for my next suspense novel. The working title is Chloe. I don't want to talk too much about it. If you talk too much, I'm kind of suspicious. Mm -hmm. I think if mm -hmm. you talk too much, mm -hmm. you'll talk so much, yeah. you won't have anything to put on paper. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, though, are any of you familiar with the Alfred Hitchcock Books, particularly Rebecca. It's oh, sort yeah. of a Rebecca. play on that, mm -hmm. a play on that, except that it's a black character. And when you look at some of these old novels, they are ripe for reimagining 
in a black community because they, they are full of, Rebecca is full of um, the privileges that some whites have and uh, the disadvantages that some other whites have. Well, I want to take that and give it a black theme and uh, play on that. That's as far as I'll go, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I will be writing my next novel. Okay. It will be um, a suspense novel. Sounds, I really enjoyed yeah. this one, okay. so yes. Good. Sounds delicious. <laughs> um, <laughs> as, Thank you. As, you know, as someone who's writing in this world about, you know, the, the deaf experience, what are your feelings about media representations of deaf people, deaf characters in films, movies, et cetera? Well, as I touched on, I think that it's um, monolithic. They, um, we're generally very vulnerable, we're helpless, we can't um, get a job, we need to be helped and guided. And surely there are some deaf people who fit into that category, but those who fit into that category usually have something else going on besides the deafness. There are many, many very capable deaf people who go on to achieve um, very lofty positions in business and social, social studies. Uh, they get PhDs, they're doctors, they're lawyers, but you don't see them portrayed in the media. When you see them in, when, when they're discussed in the media, it's because, uh, and, and well, let, let's say, well, you know, back off. First yeah. off, they're not usually portrayed <laughs> in the media. Yeah. But you know, what did <laughs> you not, think of the film Coda, which won the Oscar, was it two or three years ago? I, I have you not seen that? Coda. It, okay. was in, it was in the theater. I tried to find it on Netflix. Well, or, you have to look at it in Apple TV. Oh, That's the I only place you can see it. And I, I, I was looking at it when I was flying back from um, Las Vegas last week. And I only got to see half of it before we landed. But it's essentially a story of a young woman who's hearing. And she is the youngest child in a deaf family. Yeah, that's and what often happens. They, you know, she's the interpreter. And the family really relies on her pretty much um, for a lot of the ways in which they navigate their way through the world. And the story is really about, she's 16 or 17, and she wants to go to Berkeley School of Music because she's, she can sing. And she's got a teacher who says, you need to do this. But she's torn between feeling her um, responsibility to stay with the family who are fishermen in New England and putting her needs off. And, you know, talking with you now, it's very interesting because when the when I saw what I did see in the film, I said, well, this is a typical film of a young teenager trying to find agency and individuality <laughs> in the world. But in a way, her family as deaf people were totally dependent on her. I mean, they they couldn't navigate, they couldn't the, navigate without, the world without her, her at yeah. all. And I was a little concerned about that. And the more I'm listening to you talk, I understand what you mean. You don't see deaf people capable. You don't see deaf people walking through the world navigating comfortably. And you never see black deaf people. So I think that you're right that there's a big, big space. Um, I think that when that film won the Oscar, there was a lot of, oh, this is so great. Now we're gonna start seeing more and more deaf people. Well. Did we? No. no. But then that's the way it often is. I didn't see Coda because I don't usually go to the um, theater um, to see movies because of my hearing loss. I wait for it to come out on Netflix or, as you said, Apple, Apple TV. That's where it was yeah. completely um, from the start with this streaming thing. But I have seen thing, yeah. the previews. But the situation you described of having, she was the only deaf child She's in the only, family. She was the only hearing, hearing child, child in the family. And, and there was room. all this tension between the brother who was um, deaf, but who, want, who felt that she was privileged in the family, that she was loved more, she was cared for more because she was hearing. Wow, that sounds interesting. Yes, but it, it's not uncommon that you have both deaf and hearing people in deaf families. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think, and maybe Wanda, my interpreter here, can correct me, but I believe that most deaf children are born into hearing families. 
they are born into families where the parents are human. Um, so this situation that you described okay. where um, there's a, it's certainly one human child in the family that's deaf, and I can also see why the deaf people would become dependent on her. And mm -hmm. those deaf people may very well have been competent, able to navigate the world if it were not for the hearing people holding them back. Yeah. yeah, and the hearing mm -hmm. people, it never occurs to hear, well, maybe I should learn how to sign. No, you have to learn how to read my lips. There's never any back and forth. Okay. Yeah. There's a, there's a scene. No, what is it that they want the deaf people to learn how to read my lips? Yes. No, well, you need to learn yes. how to sign. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. And there's a point. I think at ASL, and that, that's another tricky part, signed English is different from ASL. But I think some form of signed English should be taught in elementary schools. Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. teach children French, German, Spanish. Well, how many Americans are going to meet someone where they have to converse uh, in French, German, and Spanish? Some of you will because you travel, but the vast majority never will. Yet you are likely to come across a deaf person in American society where in a shop, a restaurant, where a little mm -hmm. sign language could help you go a long way. I've often thought it should be taught in public schools. Yeah, we were talking about that um, coming over, and there was a big, I think like a lawsuit had to be filed in Montgomery County before um, ASL was recognized as a acceptable a foreign, as, as a language. Yeah, and then and as it's a definitely foreign. a language with its own syntax, everything, yes. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking on the way over about how long we've been writing. And you know, this is the 40th anniversary of the publication of my first book, Migrations of the Heart. Yes, I've been writing for 30 years. And um, I've declared this is year-long celebration. I and, uh, you know where, and you know where I met you at Gallaudet University. I was I was sharing with uh, with one again. I yeah, met. I, I had heard. I think I was working at Gallaudet when I wrote my first book. And I they invited me to give a lecture, to give a talk. Okay. And Kingman Jordan had just been, um, become the president over there, the first deaf Yes, he was president. the first deaf president at Gallaudet University. And they invited Marita to speak. So I thought um, maybe they're not, at that time you could count these successful black authors on maybe two maybe hands, two hands with, <laughs> with a couple of fingers yeah. to spare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I thought I need to go over here and introduce myself to Marita. And she, I was a little nervous at first. I didn't know how she would receive me. At that time, Sisters and Lovers had been sent to the publisher, but it had not been published yet. So I introduced myself, and she would, could, could not have been more gracious. And um, this was, I, I, I so admired her because here was someone, someone who had been doing what I wanted to do for probably almost a decade by then, but. Um, I had a great time there too. I mean, yet of course my talk was signed, but the students were very enthusiastic yes. and very welcoming. And it was a it was a great, great day. Yes. I really enjoyed it, really enjoyed it a lot. Um, what do you, what's your advice? And I'm sure that they're in the audience are people who want to write or are writing. What's your advice for for beginning emerging writers. And in a sense, I have to say, and you probably feel this way too, that mm -hmm. I'm always emerging. Um, yes. Because the, 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 the book that say I'm writing now writing has no knowledge that I've written 22 books. <laughs> I mean, it, it still say, who are you? You know, do you know how to tell this story? You know, so you're always a beginner in a way. You know, and there are a few things I recommend to aspiring authors. One of them, and probably the most important one, is three things, and that is to write, write, and write. Seriously, you never get better unless you write. And there are other things you can do, but the most important thing is to write. And you think that when you're writing and it's not coming out the way you want it and you're frustrated and you're pulling your hair out and throwing the pages away that you're wasting time. That's not wasted time. You are teaching yourself the craft of writing by doing. And I, I guarantee you, if you go through a book and write a really rough first draft, by the time you get to the end of the book, you will be a better writer than you were when you started to write the first book. 
Now, along the way, there are things you can do to help improve what you do. If you struggle with grammar, pick up a grammar book. If you struggle with plotting, pick up a book on plotting. Classes are actual classes. Uh, I took a class at a community college in uh, Montgomery County when I decided I wanted to become a writer. So take a class where, and it should be the kind of class where the best kind of class is where not only the teacher critiques your writing, but the other students critique your writing. So you get a variety of opinions. So that's what I would advise. First of all, write. Second, get some knowledge through books or courses. Um, but also, as Marita said, as a writer, you, you never stop emerging. You never stop growing and learning. The field changes. Um, it, it's a lifelong pursuit. And today, there are so many opportunities and venues for people who want to write. Um, when 40 years ago, when I published Migrations of the Heart, the idea that there were these MFA programs, Masters of Fine Art programs, that, you, that, that there was the Hearst and Wright Foundation, there, there was none of that. And many of us in the, who were beginning to write back in that period, we recognized that there needed to be institutional community for black writers. That's why we developed summer writing workshops, Hearst and Wright, Voices of Our Nation, Kimbilio, Kave Kanam. They're just a whole uh, world of great opportunities. And one of the most satisfying things I do now is I do my own workshops. And she the does. typical mm -hmm. woman, the typical person in my workshops is a black woman, late 40s above, who may be retired, thinking about retiring, um, who's had a really interesting life or who has had some issue in her life that she wants to write about. And she's really smart. She's a really good writer, but mm -hmm. nobody ever told her that she could write. And she woke up one day and said, I'm going to write. And I'm not going to just write by myself. I'm going to take a class mm -hmm. so I can learn to write really well. Mm -hmm. Because since in my professional world and life, I strove for excellence. Okay, awesome. that's what black women do. Um, mm -hmm. In this endeavor, I'm gonna strive for excellence as well. And I find it enormously satisfying to work with them. I taught for many years at the universities, George Mason, Virginia Commonwealth, but I'm doing the best teaching of my life now with these, these women who are often terrific writers who have amazing stories to tell. Um, so I think at this point now, it's a good point to take some questions from the audience. I want um, to say too, if you do take a course, make sure it's with a teacher who has written what you want to write. Yeah. There are a lot of yeah. teachers out there who have shown you how to write a novel or a book who have never been published. So I think the questions are going to be yeah, over there. Yeah, there's a mic here and a mic on the other side. And I only ask you to bring your question to the mic because we've got about 25 people who are watching online as well so we can hear your question. Okay. <coughs> Either mic. you got to bring the chair. Good evening. Can you hear me? Hi, Connie, and welcome back in terms of writing a book we've waited for you quite a while. I'm yes. here this evening, you may recognize, uh, as one of your Hampton classmates of Class of 74, Joan Pratt, Adrian, Gloria, and some other Hamptonians. Joan! Well. <laughs> <laughs> I have the name, I recognize the name. Adrian. So you all went to Hampton? In the class. She's interpreting for me because you're at a distance and so. Oh. 74. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming. And, and Alexis Roberts Colander. Alexis Roberts, yes. And my question is, what made you decide to name your character in the book Alexis Ross? <laughs> <laughs> It's a pretty name. It's a beautiful name. I, I, I like it's a it great name. 
that's a great happens. name. You know, sooner or later, you're going to pick a name belonging to someone else. But it's a beautiful name. Yeah. So it takes yeah. It, 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 I like the way it sounds. Yeah. It's, a, it's a strong name. It's a strong name. And yeah. it's a feminine name. It's a great name. I probably did some research. Yeah. You know what Alexis means? I probably did some research on that. I don't remember what I found. What was the woman on Dynasty? Yeah. Alexis. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming. How many of you went to Hampton? Oh, wow. wow. Okay. That's okay. great. Did any of you live on El Carter? In no. El Carter, no. D -D K. Oh, did you? K, K Carter. Virginia Cleveland, yeah. All of them, yeah, all of them. Okay. Wow. Oh, the names I certainly recognize, the faces. You all look beautiful now, though, but the faces, yeah, we, we have all changed. But now it's coming back to me. I'm starting to see it. We expect you to come to our 50th last year. <laughs> I went to the 25th one. Did I go to the, yeah. I think I, the 50th one. That's a long <laughs> way off, girl. <laughs> Next year. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Any other questions? Good evening. Good evening. So with all the writings and all the books that have been written, how do you struggle to not rewrite what has been written? How do I struggle not to or, or write? Or your word, challenge. <laughs> how do I struggle not to write what I wrote before? Or, or, oh, any, or any books. Um, I don't think there's anything, there's not much that hasn't been done before or hasn't been written before. It's the spin that you put on this, your unique spin that you put on the story um, and, and what you bring to the story based on your, your unique life uh, that makes it different. Mm -hmm. I don't find that a challenge. I have so many stories to tell from the unique way that I look at the world. And I think that's true for all of us. We all have a unique way of looking at the world. And you can take the same general principle, like the, the story that I'm, this book, uh, You Never Know, is really based on men who cheat. That is a common <laughs> universal theme. But there are so many different ways you can take that and put your own personal spin on that to make it different. And that's what writing really is all about. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? There's a question back there. I like I'll try to project. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, and thank you for centering people who have, uh, you know, deafness and making that something that some of us don't even really think about and just bringing us in. My question for you is about your process in terms of character, character development. What do you, can you take us through maybe one or two exercises you do or how you kind of go about developing your characters? What's the question, Ham? Oh. <laughs> Thank um, you. That's a pretty long process um, as uh, is plotting. Generally, you know, there are different, a number of different approaches you can take to develop characters. Um, there are, gen oh, that's, that's a complicated subject. Um, I do a lot of research into characters. I'm always personally considering the character's growth, the arc that the character goes through throughout the book. They often start one way, and um, I'm often thinking about and considering how the character grows or doesn't grow um, throughout the course of the novel. 
And a lot of that takes planning, uh, research, writing, before you write the first word of the book, uh, other than plot. The, the other thing I consider, certainly for all the main characters, is the, the character development, the development of um, <clears throat> the main characters. You just, there are a ton of books, some better than others, but that would be the place to start to teach yourself about uh, character development. And um, because it also has to work in, in tandem with your plot. Your characters have to move and grow as your, as your plot develops at the same time. It, and it's, um, you can spend a lot of time working that out before you start writing to make sure that that all happens in tandem. Uh, good evening, and uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, I have a question. You were talking about writing misleading clues, and I was wondering how you develop that and how many misleading clues <laughs> would you include in your novels? You, he asked about misleading clues. Oh, do you read mysteries? Well, in a mystery, there are always clues that lead you to suspect one character or another who is not the guilty party. Mm -hmm. And so you have to give thought to how you lead or others to believe that this character is suspicious uh, without... Uh, I, I hate to use the word lie about the character. Um, without you, you want to make others suspect this other character, uh, maybe the one who attacked the person or murdered the person, uh, even though he is not the one. So that's when you plant, you have them do something or you plant a clue to mislead the reader. As, Kind of, that's an interesting question. But it's something that, it, it almost happens naturally for me. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I'll have certain characters who I, I know did not do the dirty deed, but I want to throw suspicion on them. And I do things to um, make them look suspicious. Uh, something they say, the way they behave, uh, any number of things. Any other questions? Or? I wanted to end with a question. Um, my last book is The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. So since it came out in the fall of 2021, mental health and physical health has been a big concern. Mm -hmm. And we're now in the midst of a major national conversation about that. And in the black community, more and more black women are devoting time to thinking about their mental health, their physical health, and developing practices to encourage that. So I wanted to ask you, what are the practices you have that make you look so great, well, so young? You. <laughs> what, what are your practices? Um, uh, whether this was intentional or not, I have made a number of changes in my lifestyle, certainly since COVID, since the pandemic. Uh, I, I, I give a lot more thought and consideration to uh, my well-being in terms of uh, where, uh, being out in nature is one of the things that certainly has been a big help. In fact, I read studies showing that people who live in nature often live happier lives and longer lives. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time, I moved into an area actually that um, lends itself to right into a wooded area with a lot of nature around. 
around um, and is walking, which is one of the, a doctor told me and many others have told me is one of the best things you can do for your body is walk. And so I've been doing a lot more walking since I moved into this na neighborhood that has a lot of nature. It certainly makes walking. I am the type of person who needs to be encouraged or um, uh, motivated to get out and do these things. And so that's one of the reasons I moved in, into the neighborhood I moved into was because I wanted to be motivated. I wanted to have no excuse not to get out there and walk. And I'm in a, I'm in a neighborhood now where I can even walk out the door and walk in woods and along trails. And I love it. Um, I'm in Columbia, um, which is considered one of the healthiest communities uh, in the country. Um, I've been exercising more, trying to eat better. Um, I'm def and I, I, I also think too, as you get older, you become more aware of these things. Um, your body is telling you <laughs> that you need to pay attention to these things. Yes. Um, so it, it, it comes naturally. But, uh, you know, better late than never, honestly. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and attending this beautiful conversation between Connie and Marita. We have books outside for sale, and there will be a book signing outside. So thank you again for coming. Let's give them a great And if, if anyone would like to uh, get on my email list or stay in touch with me, I do have a form you can sign. We should be out of the table as well. Thank you.